So the next speaker that we have, um, Andra Burgess, uh, is, uh, received her Juris Doctorate in 2008 from Georgia State University College of Law. And um, she's a member of the Georgia and Cobb County Bar Associations, as well as the National Organiza Organization of Social Security Claimants uh, Representatives. And uh, as partner in um, uh, the law firm of Burgess and Christensen, Ms. Burgess has focused her practice on guardianship and uh, social security uh, disability um, law for adults and children. Um, and given her dedication to educate about disability, Ms. Burgess has been a speaker for uh, many organizations, include, including ours, in 2015 and 2017, as well as she's written several of our Somnus News articles, which we're very much appreciative of. And, um, and she speaks at support groups and at her local bar association. Uh, we're delighted that Ms. Burgess um, has once again agreed to give us her time and expertise to talk to us about idiopathic hypersomnia and long-term disability. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to uh, Angel Burgess. Good morning. Thank you all for having me again. I'm delighted to talk with you all today about IH and disability, what you need to know. And there is a lot that you need to know. <laughs> Statistics tell us that nearly one in four adults will become disabled at some point before they reach retirement age. The question then is, are you prepared in the event that this happens to you? I'll tell you that in my experience uh, dealing with people that have various disabilities, most people are not prepared to go out of work. And so it's important to uh, think about areas um, in which you can prepare, um, things that you can focus on in the event that one day you have to go out of work. Now for some people that time has already passed. Unfortunately, you've not been able to continue working. Um, so there'll be some information for you as well. But my goal here today is to make sure that you um, are a little bit more aware of the benefits that are available to you should you have to go out of work. Now, when you're managing a chronic disorder such as IH, there are three areas that I think are very important to focus on. Um, treatment, which we know is huge. Accommodations, if you are currently working. And insurance, because we all need to be able to live, and have a roof over our heads, and be able to see our doctors. With regard to treatment, it is important that you do your best to document the symptoms that you are experiencing. Now this doesn't have to be every day, um, but as often as you can, it's a good idea to start a journal or a diary where you're writing down uh, some of the symptoms. If you're having you know, days where you are sleeping 13 hours, um, you, know, you need to write that down. And so that when you go to the doctor, you're able to better uh, give them an overview of what symptoms you've been experiencing since the last time you were there for treatment. Finding a doctor that you can trust is vital. Um, you want to be able to be comfortable with your doctor in communicating your symptoms and how you're responding to the treatment so that your doctor knows whether tweaks need to be made in your medication um, or the dosage to, to better manage your symptoms. That ties along with being vocal about your symptoms and how you're responding to treatment. Being open to trying different things. Um, I know sometimes it can be overwhelming um, and it just seems like nothing is going to work and you know I've tried everything that I can try, but, but be open to trying different treatments. Um, ask for help. Support groups have been instrumental um, in allowing a lot of people to learn about new doctors, new opportunities, um, and to just you know, feel better and know that they're not alone um, in what you're going through. If you're working um, and you're having difficulties doing your job, it's important to know that you don't have to just quit or be fired. 
Um, for most employers, if, if there are at least 15 um, employees, you're going to be protected under the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. And so what you want to do, although it may be very uncomfortable, but you need to talk to your employer, to your supervisor, to HR, and let them know that you're having some difficulties um, because there are some protections there for you. And as long as it's not an undue hardship to your employer, they have to try to work with you, okay? But they need to know about the disability in order to work with you. While you are working with your employer to better accommodate your needs. And accommodations could be anything from um, you know, giving you additional break time or additional numbers of breaks, um, changing to you know, telecommute a couple days a week um, so that you're better able to manage your symptoms. I mean, there are so many options as far as accommodations are concerned. But while you're working on those accommodations with your employer, you need to make sure that you've looked into options for income replacement should you have to go out of work. Income replacement um, is in the form of disability insurance. Typically, there are three different types of disability insurance that you need to be concerned with. Uh, Short-term disability, long-term disability, and my favorite, social security disability. Now, short-term disability um, is typically an employer-sponsored plan. So some employers may pay for short-term disability. Um, others will require you to pay some part of you know, premium to get the short-term disability. But it's also available for you privately. So you can seek your own private short-term disability um, policy. The idea behind short-term disability is that it's going to replace a portion of your income but it's gonna be for a short period of time. Most of those policies um, will be anywhere from three to six months. And you know, with certain conditions, like IH, you may be out of work for more than three to six months. So short-term disability is not going to be enough to carry you through the next year or two or five. So it's, it's a good thing to have. Um, to try to bridge the gap when you go out of work, but you're going to need more than that. Which brings me to long-term disability uh, insurance. Most often, this is also an employer-sponsored plan, but typically, you will have to supplement the cost of the long-term disability plan through your employer. You can also purchase a private policy and it's going to replace a portion of your paycheck for a longer period of time. Now, the thing about long-term disability um, is that the policies, they're different. Different insurance companies offer different policies. Um, so there is no uniform policy in terms of the benefits that are offered, the type of policy that, that you'll receive, or the duration. Um, so most policies are what are called own occupation policies. And what that means is because of the disability, you're not able to do the particular job that you are currently performing. Now, own occupation policies um, can last anywhere from, you know, most will be like two-year policies, and then from that point, it changes over to an any occupation policy where you have to prove that you can't work at all. So it's important to know what kind of policy you have, what the provisions are, and how long the benefits are available to you. Now the application process for long-term disability, again, is going to vary from policy to policy. Um, but what you'll want to do is certainly look at the policy uh, and Quite honestly, these policies, they're, it's like gibberish, okay? It's impossible to decipher what they're saying, what they're covering, um, and that's where a consultation with a long-term disability attorney is going to be to your benefit, um, specifically if you can do it ahead of time so that you know what's available to you and what other things you may need to do to plan. 
Now, with long-term disability policies, um, your doctor and your doctor's opinions are very important. Um, so you want to make sure, again, that you're communicating with your doctor not only about your symptoms, but how those symptoms are affecting your ability to perform your job. Um, your doctor is going to be asked to complete a form or a statement um, regarding your condition and your ability or inability to do your job. Medical records are going to be requested um, as well as considered and sometimes the long-term uh, disability insurers will send you out um, for an independent medical examination to be evaluated by a doctor of their choosing. Um, they may also send you out for uh, what's called an FCE or a functional capacities evaluation to assess your ability to you know, do certain things, sit, stand, walk, um, lift, things of that nature. One thing that's important to know if you've applied for long-term disability is that a private investigator may be following you and uh, looking to see what your day-to-day -day activities are really like. You know, they'll look to see if what you're reporting is consistent with what you're doing, you know, when you're going to the grocery store or you're going to church. Um, and that can be video surveillance, it usually is, um, as well as reports that have been written. So you do want to keep that in mind as well. And then ultimately a decision is made by the insurance company to either approve deny the application, or request additional information. Now let's contrast long-term disability with Social Security disability. Um, unfortunately, all roads end at Social Security disability. Um, so even if you have been able to secure long-term disability benefits, the reality is you are most likely going to have to apply for Social Security disability whether you want to or not. Now Social Security says that in order to be disabled, you have to be unable to engage in substantial gainful activity um, for any reason, whether it's physical, mental, or a combination of both. And because of the severity of your conditions, they're expected to either last in death or to prevent you from working for at least uh, a year. Given your age, education, and your background, essentially that it's going to eliminate your ability to be competitive in the job market. That is different than most long-term disability policies uh, definition of disability, at least during the first two years. So with Social Security disability, what happens is you have to, for most people, you go through this three-step process. You file an application. Most people are going to get denied. Um, approximately a quarter to a third of people who get disability will be approved at the initial level. So most people get denied at the initial level. They have to file an appeal, which is called reconsideration. Um, now, most states have the reconsideration uh, step some don't. So if you live in a state that doesn't have reconsideration, you're lucky because you can just skip that portion of the process and, and move on to a hearing if you get denied. But for the vast majority of us, we have reconsideration. So um, at that level, approximately 7 to 10 percent of people will be approved, which is very low. And so most will have to move on to the level where you're requesting a hearing before an administrative law judge. And most people that do get approved for disability get approved after they have been in front of an administrative law judge. Now let's look at the difference between Social Security disability and long-term disability. Um, with long-term disability, as I stated earlier, the policy terms are going to vary. Social Security, on the other hand, has a universal set of rules, okay? They've got specific regulations that um, apply to everyone who is seeking benefits, whether you live in Georgia or Maryland. With long-term disability benefits, your eligibility can be either through your employer or you can purchase um, private insurance. With Social Security disability, on the other hand, your eligibility is going to be through either your payment of FICA taxes, so you're working and every paycheck that you get, 
You're paying into FICA, which is funding disability and retirement. Um, if you are self-employed, you can be eligible for disability through paying your self-employment taxes. If you do not have the work background, you can be eligible for Social Security disability um, based upon financial need. As far as the waiting period is concerned for long-term disability, it's typically either 90 days or 120 days. So that's why you want to have short-term disability. Hopefully that ends and you roll right into long-term disability. And so there's, there's a, a minimal interruption in your income during this time frame. Social Security disability benefits, if you get approved right away, you still have a waiting period of five months if you've worked and paid into the system. If you have not worked and paid into the system and you meet the requirements based upon financial need, um, then there is no waiting period. The duration of benefits for long-term disability is going to vary. Um, it could be up to retirement age, but as I stated earlier, with most policies, two years is the own occupation, and then it, it switches over to any job. For Social Security disability, the maximum duration is going to be up to retirement age. Now, with long-term disability, you may have a problem with pre-existing conditions you can become ineligible for these benefits based upon the policy um, with certain pre-existing conditions. So you do need to be aware of that. With Social Security disability, it doesn't exist. They're just evaluating you as a whole person. It doesn't matter um, you know, if you became disabled um, you know, two years ago from an auto accident or if it's been a gradual um, worsening of your condition over time. With long-term disability, you need to get proof of your disability um, from your treating physician to file a claim. With Social Security disability, um, you don't. Now, in order to get approved, you certainly want to have some medical support, but they do not require you to have anything from a doctor to apply for Social Security disability. Both forms of disability are based upon a medical records review process. So either way, medical records are vital um, to a fair evaluation of your claim. Some additional um, differences and similarities. As I stated earlier, with long-term disability, there are some conditions that are going to be excluded from coverage. For Social Security, they are considering you, again, as a whole person. So, for example, um, if you are dealing with symptoms from IH, um, but also depression, um, they are going to look at the depression. They're going to look at what your doctors say about the management of those symptoms. And if you're taking any additional medications for depression, um, how are you responding to those medications? And how would you be able to perform from a mental health standpoint? So your interaction with other people, um, being able to stay on task, being able to accept criticism, things like that. So Social Security will consider it all in the uh, evaluation of your claim. Now earlier I stated that all roads end at Social Security um, disability, and that's because most long-term disability policies require that you apply for Social Security disability as well. And here's the reason. The insurance company does not want to have to pay, you know, they don't want to have to assume all of the responsibility for paying you benefits. So if they can require you to apply for Social Security disability and you get approved, that reduces the amount of money that they need to pay you, they being the insurance company. So most of us will find in our policies, you have to apply for Social Security disability as well. And if you don't, what they can do is they can just subtract the amount of money that you would have received from Social Security disability from your long-term benefit. And you don't want that. So keep that in mind. Um, and that is where the offset comes in. Long-term disability benefits um, are available to workers. Okay, Obviously, you're working. You're not able to sustain the job. 
But with social security disability, again, you do not have to be a worker. You could have never worked and you can be eligible for SSI, which is the income and asset based program. Children can also be eligible for SSI. Obviously, they've never worked um, because they're disabled. But again, the family has to meet certain income and asset requirements. And also, um, disabled adult children can be eligible for Social Security disability based upon their parents' earnings record. You can be eligible for long-term disability benefits and ineligible for Social Security disability benefits at the same time. It is important that you consult with a long-term disability attorney to try to prevent that from happening. Okay, um, hopefully you can consult with someone before you get to the place where you need to apply for long-term disability or social security disability. But <clears throat> what I see oftentimes is I have a client that meets the own occupation definition with long-term disability. So Jenny was a flight attendant. She's 45 years old, she has IH. Um, she cannot safely perform the duties as a flight attendant um, if she's unable to manage her symptoms. So she gets approved for long-term disability. She asks her doctor to fill out you know, a statement about her inability to work and her doctor says you know, she can't be on her feet for more than three hours during the day. Well, we know a flight attendant is always on their feet, right? So that's going to eliminate that job. But Social Security Disability looks at the any job standard. So they're going to say, this very helpful evaluation from her doctor tells us she can perform other jobs that don't require her to be on her feet um, you know, for more than three hours a day. So while she's going to receive those long-term disability benefits, Social Security can legitimately deny her for Social Security disability benefits, because they'll say, well, she can, you know, she can be a data entry clerk and she can sit down and perform all the duties of her job. So how do you prove your disability? Well, it's not easy, especially when we are dealing with IH and you know, there are um, no x-rays or objective things that people can easily identify with. Um, with IH, Social Security Administration, and I'm, I'm sure long-term disability insurance carriers have some trouble understanding what's happening to you. So it's critical that you are seeing your doctor on a regular basis. If you're not seeing your doctor, then there's no proof. If you have gaps in treatment where you haven't seen a doctor in a year, the assumption is going to be that you didn't see a doctor because you got better just like that, and you didn't need a doctor, and you don't need the benefits, and we know that that's not the case. So you do want to make sure that you are getting regular treatment, um, that you are going through the proper channels, which your doctors will, in order to um, accurately diagnose the IH or, or whatever condition um, it is that you are dealing with, but also how you're responding to treatment. You know, if you are experiencing side effects, you need to communicate that because that's going to be important also in evaluating your ability to work. And of course, the doctor opinion letters, forms, statements are also helpful. Now, one thing that has been tremendously helpful for many of my clients has been employment records. You would be surprised at how many employers in this day and age will still document things like sending you an email. I hear that you have some condition, but you're missing too many days of work. Or I heard from your supervisor that you were asleep at your desk when he went to ask you about a report. That becomes evidence in a social security disability claim. Um, I'm, not, I'm sure that in a long-term disability case, it will also be considered as evidence as well. Um, if you get terminated, a lot of times the um, 
separation notices from the Department of Labor may say things like inability to perform her job due to her health or to uh, excessively absent from her job. So all of those things are helpful because it explains to Social Security that you had difficulties performing your job because of your condition, not because you just didn't want to go to work. If you um, go to vocational rehabilitation, they will uh, assess you, okay? They will oftentimes do psychological evaluations. They will do work readiness evaluations where they put you in an employment uh, situation and they look to see how well you do the tasks that they've assigned. And those reports can be helpful as well if you're having difficulties and they're noting things like, you know, having trouble focusing to complete the job or not following instructions or falling asleep on the job. All of those things can be helpful as well. For younger adults or for adults that are in school, um, records from the school, if you have accommodations through um, your school's disability department, that could be helpful. If you're given things like extra time to take tests or one-on-one -on -one instruction, um, if you're having to um, have teachers ask you questions for clarity to make sure that you're able to retain the information that you're being provided, all of that serves as evidence in a disability case as well. Most importantly, and I'm sorry that this is jumbled, but stay encouraged. I know that this is a very difficult time for you and that symptoms um, you know, may not be managed as well as you would like for them to be, but if you can prepare for the challenges that lie ahead, it will greatly reduce the stress um, on you and on your family because you won't have to worry about finances or being able to get to the doctor because you planned ahead. So I thank you for your time, um, and if anyone has any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Yes, sir. Yes, if you uh, live in one state and work in another, which would you attempt to file? The state you work in or the state you live in? Right, so, so you will file um, for Social Security disability, and everything is going to be based upon where you live. Now, for long-term disability, remember, for most people, it's going to be an employer-sponsored plan, so it's going to be something that you do through your employer. Social Security disability, you will just go to your local uh, Social Security office to apply. And that's because Social Security administrative law judges um, are the same. So depending on the office that you go to, it's the same group of judges. And you want a, an attorney that's familiar with the judge that you'll have to go before in the future. So yes, a local attorney, in my opinion, is your best way to go. You're welcome. Hi, Hello. thank you for this information. I just have a quick question about whether there's a cap to Social Security for a non-working, uh, you know, I have a college-age daughter, she hasn't been able to work. Um, and if there isn't a cap, you know, you know, in getting the, the, not the amount, but I mean the time frame, will she be able to get it for the rest of her life? And if so, does she have to keep reapplying every year? Okay, good question. So with Social Security Disability, um, if you have not worked, as long as she meets the requirements of disability, she will continue to get benefits. Now, if you are a worker, what happens is you will get the Social Security Disability benefits until you've reached your full retirement age, and then those benefits will simply convert over to retirement benefits. You're welcome. Yes, I'm oh, sorry. Um, my daughter will be graduating from college next year and going into the job market looking for a job. At what point is it appropriate to tell your um, prospective employer about your condition um, to, so you can be covered by ADA but still get hired? <laughs> well, that's tricky. So although um, the ADA prevents discrimination in hiring practices as well, 
you know, we, we're all pretty realistic, right? Um, we know that an employer is looking out for their company's best interest. Um, so she may have more options available to her uh, once she's been able to start performing the job and show that she is a good worker. Um, and then as difficulties arise, she may want to let the employer know at that time. Um, but it can be pretty difficult to make it past step one, walking into the door with an obvious disability or one that, that has been laid out on the table. And that's just the, the reality, okay? I, the ADA is there to protect you, but it can be very difficult to prove that there's discrimination in hiring practices. Uh, Ms. Burtis, you um, cited some numbers in terms of when uh, a social security uh, filing reaches the administrative, administrative judge case yes. stage. Um, do you know if there are any studies that look at that, break it down in terms of when someone has a sleep disorder, is that uh, percentage higher, lower? So we actually looked into this last year to see um, what information was out there, and there's not much, okay? Um, what we looked at were appeals um, to see whether IH was mentioned at all. And, and it can be mentioned along with other conditions, but it's difficult to determine the severity of the IH. That can be a diagnosis that's not a proper diagnosis. Um, so there is little to no reliable information about sleep disorders. Now I will tell you that the Social Security Administration um, has addressed narcolepsy in its regulations, um, but as we all know, narcolepsy is not IH. Um, but it's, it's the closest thing that we have um, to IH and it often makes it a little bit easier to explain to a judge what the difference is, but it really requires some support from your doctor, like a good narrative letter that explains from the doctor, you know, to whom it may concern, exactly what IH is, how it differs from narcolepsy, the symptoms um, that you can be expected to experience, the objective um, measures uh, that are used, you know, the MSLT, the PSG, diagnostic tests um, that are used in the diagnosis as far as treatment options. So that's really your best bet is a combination of a letter from your doctor explaining the symptoms. And of course, if, if you've got an attorney that's familiar with uh, IH and or at least sleep disorders, um, that can help the judge to differentiate between the two and appreciate the severity of IH. Thank you. Thank you. If um, a person applies in January, doesn't get accepted until November, and it's approved for Social Security, do they get retroactively paid for that period of time? So the answer is it depends, okay? <laughs> if you applied in January, and you're alleging that you became disabled in January and Social Security approves you in November and says, yes, you became disabled in January, then you will get some back pay. However, it is not going to go all the way back to January unless you applied for SSI. If you applied for the workers program, you have that five month waiting period. So you'll lose the first five months of benefits. Um, so in that case, you know, you would lose January, February, March, April, and May. And your back pay would be from June through November. Now one thing I did not mention, um, and I'll mention briefly, is I've talked about looking for an attorney Attorneys for long-term disability and Social Security disability are typically paid the same way, which is on a contingency basis. Most are not going to ask you for any money up front or out of your pocket, but are going to be paid 
out of the benefits that you receive. For long-term disability, they'll be paid from the weekly benefits that you receive um, or monthly benefits that you receive, or if there's a settlement, they'll be paid out of the settlement. They usually charge anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of what you're receiving, which seems high. However, if you're not getting any benefits, you'd wish that you'd you know, retained an attorney. On the Social Security disability side, attorneys are paid out of past due benefits only. So in your example, ma'am, out of the past due benefits from June through November, your Social Security attorney would be paid 25% of those months' benefits only, and the benefits are capped at $6,000 on the Social Security disability side. Okay, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate your Thank expertise. you all.